well. The title in this morning is The Lord is My Portion. The Lord is My Portion. And this is coming from Joshua chapter 13. Once again, this is a portion of Scripture that uh, most preachers would not select to preach through verse by verse because it's a bit difficult, a, a lot of places and names, but there's great meaning behind the text. And, you know, one of the reasons that I'm stubborn enough to preach verse by verse through books of the Bible like Joshua is because I want to demonstrate to you that there is much precious truth even in these long, difficult books of the Old Testament. Joshua chapter 13 tells us that the majority of the land of Israel has been conquered, and then the land begins to be allotted or divided up. And we're told about how the 12 tribes would have the land divided up between them. And so there's a bit of a summary as we begin this morning in Joshua 13, as it looks to Joshua at the end of his life, and the Lord tells him to divide the land among the 12 tribes. They've conquered the land, and now each tribe is going to have their own territory, uh, almost as a state, if it were, within the land of Israel. So Joshua 13, beginning in verse 1, we read, Now Joshua was old and advanced in years, and the Lord said to him, You are old and advanced in years, and there remains yet very much land to possess. This is the land that yet remains, all the regions of the Philistines, and all those of the Geshurites. Now just so you know, this is the western portion of the land of Israel, from the central western portion to the northwestern portion. The Philistines and the Geshurites lived along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. So this is the land left to be possessed. Verse 13, from Shihor, which is east of Egypt, northward to the boundary of Ekron, it is counted as Canaanite. And there are five rulers of the Philistines, those of Gaza, Ashdod, Ashkelon, Gath, and Ekron. You might remember the story, by the way, of a young boy named David, a little sheep herder, as it were, who had to fight a Goliath among the Philistines from the land of Gath, mentioned here. Goliath was, of course, one of those from Gath of the Philistines who still were yet to be conquered. There are all those of the Avim, verse 4, in the south, and all the land of the Canaanites and Mirah that belongs to the Sidonians and to Aphek and to the boundaries of the Amorites and the land of the Gebelites and all Lebanon. Toward the sunrise to Baal God, below Mount Hermon to Labo Hamath and all the inhabitants of the hill country from Lebanon to Mish, Misrephoth Maim, even all the Sidonians. I myself will drive them out from before the people of Israel. And listen to what God says to Joshua. Only allot the land to Israel for an inheritance as I have commanded you, now therefore divide this land for an inheritance to the nine tribes and the half-tribe of Manasseh. Here's what you need to understand. They haven't conquered those lands yet. They are still in the hands of these pagan peoples, the Philistines and the Geshurites. But God says in verse 7, in verse 6, I myself will drive them out from before the people of Israel. I'm going to give you these lands. This, of course, would happen later in biblical history under the campaigns of King Saul and King David. So it would take centuries before this would happen. But nonetheless, God says, I will do this 
only allot the land of Israel as for an inheritance. Now notice this. You don't have it yet, but go ahead and allot it to those tribes. It's their land. This is guaranteed. God has said he will do it. It's as good as done. Go ahead and allot it to the people. Now the word for allot in Hebrew is the word for how the lot falls, when a lot would be cast. And of course the proverb says that the lot is cast, but it falls according to the plan of the Lord. The reality is, is that lots would fall, and when lots would be cast, it was understood that God is sovereign even over how the lot would fall. Now, we don't cast lots in our days anymore, in our day anymore, but nonetheless, this would be like if you rolled a, a, a dice. If you rolled dice, they would... They would turn up a number, and the point is, is that the people understood that God's even sovereign over what would turn up. And so, when he says, allot the land, it literally in the Hebrew says, give it the way that it falls. Portion it out according to how the lot falls, meaning it is up to the sovereign hand of God that these territories will one day fall into the hands of the people of Israel. So go ahead and mark it down. It's yours. God will cause the lot to fall and the land will belong to you because God is sovereign over what will happen in the future. This is a promise that would, would be fulfilled a few centuries later, but God goes ahead and tells them that it is as good as done. So divide up the land. Brothers and sisters, we need to understand that our God is sovereign over everything that happens in our lives. We need to understand that He has already determined the end from before the beginning. From ancient times, things that have not yet come to pass. Isaiah chapter 46 verse 10. We need to understand that our God rules and reigns over the heavens and the earth and everything that happens. Now, as we look to verse 8, we see the land that is going to be divided east of Jordan. The first portion of land west of the Jordan is given to the nine tribes and the half-tribe of Manasseh. Now you might be saying, well, what's this deal of the half-tribe? Manasseh and Ephraim are half-tribes, and the reason for that is, is that their father was Joseph. And you have the 12 sons of Jacob. And of course, if you've read Genesis, you know that was dead. He portioned out the land of, uh, he, he gave out the inheritance of Joseph to his. Joseph's two sons, Jacob's grandsons, Ephraim and Manasseh. And so for that reason, you have the half-tribe of Ephraim and the half-tribe of Manasseh. Because in the blessing that was given to the twelve sons of Jacob in Genesis chapter 49, the portion of Joseph was given to his two sons divided equally. So, we read in verse 8, And with the other half of the tribe of Manasseh, the Reubenites and the Gadites received their inheritance, which Moses gave them beyond the Jordan eastward, as Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave them. And this is the land that they received. From Aror, which is on the edge of the valley of Arnon, and the city that is in the middle of the valley, and all the table land of Medabah, as far as Debon, and all the cities of Sihon, as far as the Amorites, who reigned in Heshbon, as far as the boundaries of the Ammonites, and Gilead, and the region of the Geshurites, and the Ma Maakathites, and all Mount Hermon, and all Bashan, and Salakah, and all the kingdom of Og and Bashan, who reigned in Ashtaroth and in Adre, he alone was left of the remnant of Rephaim. These Moses has, had struck and driven out. So these are the peoples that were conquered under the leadership of the prophet Moses, east of the Jordan River, before Joshua would lead the people of Israel across the Jordan into the interior of the land of Israel to conquer the land west of the Jordan. 
So these are all the people, the tribes, and the lands that were inherited from the campaign that Moses led east of the Jordan River. Verse 13, Yet the people of Israel did not drive out the Geshurites or the Maacathites, but Geshur and Maacath dwell in the midst of Israel to this day. This was noted in the book of Numbers that they didn't finish conquering all the land. And the people who were left there, the Geshurites and the Maacathites, try to say that five times fast, they um, were a, a thorn in the side of the land of Israel even to the day that Joshua was written. What we see is, is that the incomplete campaign, both in Moses' day and Joshua's day, when they didn't do all that God had commanded, they did most of it. They, they, they took out most of the peoples from the land, but not all of them. They found that even disobeying God in one small area showed up later in life and history as a thorn in their side. Brothers and sisters... If we obey God in most parts of our life, but not in all parts, we will find that the areas in which we have not been obedient to the Lord and have not carried out His will will follow us for years and decades and sometimes generations to come. And that's exactly what the Israelites experience. So let this be a warning to you. Do not have areas of disobedience in your life where you entertain certain sins or refuse to obey the will of God in certain areas because those sins and those areas in your life in which you should have obeyed God and did not will follow you. And that's not to say that there isn't grace and forgiveness for those sins. There is, but the reality, anyone who is here today who is more than about 30 years old can tell you that the sins of your youth will follow you throughout the rest of your life. And so we need to be careful of the choices we make and the way that we live. Because if we do not obey God, we will reap the consequences. And there is grace, and there is forgiveness, but this is an unavoidable truth. And Scripture warns us of it. Now notice in verse 14, it's, it's very strange. I'm reading all the names of the tribes and the lands that they inherit. And then we get to the tribe of Levi. Now you'll remember, if you know your Old Testament, that Levi was the son of the high priest Aaron, the brother of Moses. And you will know that the Levites are the tribe from which the priests came. You see, it is the priest who served the spiritual needs of the people of Israel. They were the ones who were sacrificing all of those animals that were commanded to be blood sacrifices under the Old Covenant. And praise God, as one who is a minister of the gospel today, I'm thankful that I'm not living under the Old Covenant and not constantly sacrificing goats and bulls and lambs. It was, it, I mean, basically the priests were largely butchers who were constantly butchering and cutting up animals. It was labor intensive. It, of course, was messy work. And it required a huge number of priests to do the amount of work that had to be done to bring sacrifices for the sins of the people of Israel. And so when we get to the tribe of Levi, from which the priests serve Israel, you would expect that the ministers of the covenant that God made with Moses, the priests, you would expect that there would be a, a generous apportionment to them. After all, they're looking after the spiritual needs of God's people. But we read in verse 14... To the tribe of Levi alone Moses gave no inheritance. What? No inheritance? Nothing?
as he said to them. This stands out. This is peculiar. The tribe of Levi gets no land. Instead, they get the offerings by fire, the offerings that are made to the Lord God of Israel. That is their inheritance, the offerings that the people were bringing. We'll look at this more when we get to the end of the chapter, but this is peculiar. This stands out. In all the list of the lands that these tribes are receiving, this one tri- tribe, Levi, gets no land. Not a single acre. Verse 15. Now we read, and I will read quickly, so buckle up and hold on. We read the other tribes and the lands they receive. Verse 15 says, And Moses gave an inheritance to the tribe of the people of Reuben according to their clans. So their territory was from Aror, which is on the edge of the valley of Arnon, the city that is in the middle of the valley, and all the tableland of Madabah, with Heshbon and all its cities that are in the tableland, Debon and Bamoth, Baal, Beth, Baal, Ma'an, and Jahaz, and Kedamoth, and Mepha'ath, and Kiriathim, and Sibma, and Zareth, Shahar, on the hill of the valley, and Beth Peor, and the slopes of Pisgah, and Beth Jeshemoth, that is, all the cities of the tableland, and all the kingdom of Sihon, king of the Amorites, who reigned in Heshbon, whom Moses defeated with the leaders of Midian, Evi, and Rechem, and Zor, and Hor, and Reba, the princes of Sihon, who lived in the land. Verse 22. Balaam, also the son of Beor, the one who practiced divination, Numbers 22 to 24, you can find the story of Balaam and the donkey. Um, by the way, children, uh, Shrek is not the first time uh, that there was ever a story with a talking donkey. And here's the good part. This story in the Bible is real. There really is a donkey who talked. Read about it in Numbers 22 to 24. So... Mentioning Balaam, who practiced divination, he was killed by the sword by the people of Israel among the rest of the slain. Verse 23, And the border of the people of Reuben was the Jordan as a boundary. This was the inheritance of the people of Reuben, according to their clans with the cities and villages. So that is the region that the tribe of Reuben inherits. Verse 24, Moses gave an inheritance also to the tribe of Gad, to the people of Gad, according to their clans, their tor- territory was Jazer and all the cities of Gilead and half of the land of the Ammonites to Aror, which is east of Rabbah, and from Heshbon to Ramoth Miz- Mizpeh and to Betanim and from Mahanaim to the territory of Debir, from the valley of Beth Haram to Beth uh, Beth Nimrah, Sakoth, and Zaphon, the rest of the kingdom of Sihon, king of Heshbon. of the people of Gad according to their clans within their cities and their villages. And Moses gave it as an inheritance to the half-tribe of Manasseh. And Manasseh, being a half-tribe, gets half of a portion, right? Um, the land is being split up into twelfths for the twelve tribes of Israel, and Ephraim and Manasseh are half-tribes, so they each get half a portion. So it says in verse 29, And Moses gave an inheritance to the half-tribe of Manasseh. It was allotted to the half-tribe of the people of Manasseh according to their clans. Their region extended from Mahanaim through all Bashan, the whole kingdom of Og of Bashan, and all the towns of Jair, which are Bashan, 60 miles, and half Gilead, and Ashtaroth, and Adre, and the cities of the kingdom of Og and Bashan. These were allotted to the people of Makir, son of Manasseh, for the half of the people of Makir according to their clans. Now I read all that because I want you to hear all the lands, hundreds of thousands of acres of land being inherited. Now you might find this boring, but if your name were written down in that will, and that land is worth a fortune, you would have been paying closer attention. You need to understand, this is like a reading of the family will. And these are the lands that these tribes and these peoples inherit. And they're getting vast acreage worth 
a fortune. And you come back to it and you go, and the entire tribe of Levi gets nothing? I mean, what, what would it have taken for the land to be divided up into 13 parts? I mean, each tribe would have just given up a small portion of territory. Each of the 12 give a little bit of their land, and then the tribe of Levi would have something, and it would all be equal. Why did God do it this way? You see, I'm convinced Joshua 13 is written in the way it is to highlight the fact that the tribe of Levi got no land. Why is that? The end of the chapter, the last two verses, draw us in to the real meaning. Verse 32. These are the inheritances that Moses distributed in the plains of Moab beyond the Jordan east of Jericho. Verse 33. But to the tribe of Levi, Moses gave no inheritance. The Lord God of Israel is their inheritance, just as he said to them. They don't get any land, they get the Lord. Now, if you're part of the people of Israel, you might, or part of the people of Levi, you might say, well, that's nice, but I'd also like some some acreage too. That wouldn't be too bad. But there is a spiritual principle. And I want to take you back through the Old Testament. And I want to walk you through some passages. Because brothers and sisters, if we don't read our Bibles from beginning to end, if we don't follow these concepts through, we're going to miss what's really being said. N notice the last part of verse 33, the very last phrase in chapter 13. He distributed it, or he, he gave them no inheritance because God is their inheritance, just as he said to them. Moses gave no inheritance to the tribe of Levi because that's what God said to them. Where did God say that to them? I'm glad you asked. I'll show you. Numbers chapter 18. Numbers chapter 18. I want you to follow this theme in the Old Testament of the tribe of Levi not getting any land, but instead getting the Lord as their inheritance or as their portion. Numbers 18, beginning in verse 21. God says to the Levites, I That's what the word tithe means. Literally, the Hebrew word is said tithe. And so, I give a tenth or a tithe. To the Levites, I have given every tithe or tenth in Israel for an inheritance. In return for their service that they do, their service in the tent of meeting. So they work daily as priests, and it was a full-time job because there were a lot of animals that had to be sacrificed. Verse 22, so that the people of Israel do not come near the tent of meeting lest they bear sin and die. The priests needed to be busy in the tent of meeting at the tabernacle and later in the temple they needed to be busy about the Lord's work sacrificing on behalf of Israel. And they needed to be financially supported in this work and receive the tithe as their inheritance so that the people of Israel do not come near the tent of meeting because they would then bear sin and die. Why would they bear sin and die? Because that's not the way God commanded it to be done. Do you remember when Saul tried to offer the offering to God and didn't wait on Samuel and how displeased the Lord was with him. You have to do things God's way according to God's command. And God said that there will be one-twelfth of the people, the entire tribe of Levi, and they will serve as priests on behalf of God's people. And the people will all give a tenth of their income to support the ministry of the priests who were offering sacrifices on behalf of the people of Israel for their sins. 
Verse 23, but the Levites shall do the service of the tent of meeting. And they shall bear their iniquity, meaning they have to offer sacrifices for their own sins. Because unlike Jesus, who is a high priest without sin, all these priests were sinners as well. It shall be a perpetual statute throughout your generations and among the people of Israel. They shall have no inheritance. For the tithe of the people of Israel, which they present as a contribution to the Lord, I have given to the Levites for an inheritance. Therefore, I have said of them that they shall have no inheritance among the people of Israel. Well, I guess I should explain this a little bit. I've made you all sufficiently nervous. I've probably said the word tithe at least seven or eight times now. What is this all about? Uh, let me explain a little bit of biblical theology here as it relates to this command. They're living under the commands of the Mosaic Covenant, the Old Covenant, the covenant that God made with the people of Israel at Mount Sinai in Exodus 19 through 25. You read it there. So in the Old Covenant, God commanded a system of sacrifices for animals. Now, sacrifices, uh, sacrifices for sins were made earlier in Scripture. We see that, you know, with Cain and Abel. We see that uh, with Noah when he gets off the ark and Abraham. And so sacrifices had been done before, but there's this entire system of sacrifices instituted in the Mosaic Covenant, the Old Covenant. And the Levites were to offer sacrifices on behalf of the people. And you remember, like in the book of Job, Job was the priest of his family, so to speak, being a father, and he offered sacrifices for his household and for his children, you remember. Under the old covenant, the priests were to serve to offer sacrifices for the whole nation. And so no longer did sacrifices have to be offered by the head of every household, every husband and father. In doing so, these priests would have no time to do other work, so they would be financially supported by the people. And it says here in Numbers 18 that they would receive a tenth, a tithe, from the people. So the question is, are we under this law of tithe today? In order to answer that question, I need to answer it very exactly. No, we are not under the old covenant laws these are ceremonial laws in ancient Israel that were a part of the sacrificial system. And just as we do not offer blood sacrifices today because Christ has fulfilled the old covenant, so we are no longer under a law of tithing today as they were under the old covenant. So the question we need to ask ourselves is, what is the standard of giving under the new covenant? For instance, if you look in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus would take Old Testament texts, and he would say, you have heard that it was said, but I say to you, he would cite the Old Testament, and then he would heighten that command. He would say, you have heard that it was said, do not murder, but I say to you, if any man is angry with his brother, he is guilty. And so we see that murder starts with anger. He says, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I tell you that any man who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Jesus took those Old Testament commands and he heightened them in the Sermon on the Mount. Are we under the law of tithing? Not exactly, but there is... An expectation of giving under the New Testament, most extensively in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9, which is the most extensive part of the New Testament that deals with giving. And we are told that there that God loves a cheerful giver. And he wants us to give not, uh, not reluctantly, but from a cheerful heart. The question we need to ask is not am I under the tithe law that they were that they were. Um, regulated by under the old covenant because that answer obviously is no 
The answer, the, the question we need to ask is, if God expected his people under the old covenant to give a tithe, a tenth of their income, to the Lord and to the tabernacle and the temple and today, what should be the portion that we would give to God's local church? If God expected a tithe under the old covenant, what does he expect under the new covenant? And my answer to that would simply be this, I don't think God has lowered the standard of giving under the new covenant. So no, we are not under the tithe laws, but yes, we should at least keep the standard of giving that they had under the old covenant. As if under the new and greater covenant, God would lower the standard of giving. So what we see in the New Testament is God saying, give sacrificially, give generously from a thankful heart. And my personal practice and what I would counsel you to do is, is see tithing, giving a tenth of your income, see that as a baseline, that I at least give that. When I am paid, I take 10%, and that is simply written to the church, and I give that to the local church. Then I give above and beyond that as I am able to various needs. But I think we need to see the, the old covenant tithe law as a kind of guide. It's not a law. We're not under the old covenant, but it does serve as a faithful guide as to what giving should look like. And then we apply that under the new covenant to the commands to give generously and sacrificially to the work of God's kingdom. So if you're asking me the question, should I tithe? I guess I would say yes, but not because you have to, but because you want to. Because God loves a cheerful giver. That we should see the old covenant standard of giving as a, as a basic foundation and standard of how we should give under the new covenant. And remember, the reason for the tithe was to support, under the Old Covenant, the work of the Levitical priests. Under the New Covenant, why do we give a tithe? To support the work of the local church. To further the gospel of Jesus Christ. The reason that they gave it was so that the gospel and the word of God would go forth. Continuing on in the Old Testament, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 18, and I will show you this. Deuteronomy 18, verse 1. The Levitical priest, all the tribe of Levi, shall have no portion or inheritance with Israel. They shall eat the Lord's offering as their inheritance. So notice this. The Levitical priests were literally fed by the faithful giving of the other tribes. Now, I want to ask you a question. They have no land of their own, the Levitical families, the priest and his wife and children. The tribe of Levi has no land of their own, which means they have no cattle of their own. They have no fields of their own where they're growing food. And there was no local grocery store in ancient Israel. What happens if the people of Israel stop giving a tithe? Answer? The priests and their wives and children would all starve to death. And God set it up that way. He made the ministers of the Old Covenant dependent upon the faithful giving of God's people. And if they were unfaithful in their giving, then the ministers of the Old Covenant and their families would literally have nothing to eat. It says in Leviticus 18.1, they shall eat the Lord's offering as their inheritance. Verse 2, they shall have no inheritance among their brothers. God explicitly charges that they would not have land of their own. Otherwise, they would have food that they could grow for themselves and animals that they could raise for themselves. But God wants them to be dependent upon the faithful giving of his people. The Lord is their inheritance. As he promised them, verse 3, and this shall be the priest's due from the people. From those offering a sacrifice, whether an ox or a sheep, they shall give to the priest the shoulder and the two cheeks and the stomach. Now, I kind of took offense to that. They didn't even get the best part. You know, the shoulder and the cheeks and the stomach. But anyways, that's what they got. I kind of wanted the filet mignon. But verse 4, 
The first fruits of your grain, of your wine, and your oil, and the first fleece of your sheep, you shall give him. What is a first fruit? The first part. When you receive, when you slaughter an animal, when you receive income, whatever it is, when you receive something, a harvest, or in our day when you get paid, you first take the first fruit, the first part, and you give that as God commanded. And under the old covenant, the amount you would give would be 10%, a tenth, a tithe. Verse 5, for the Lord your God has chosen him out of all your tribes to stand and minister in the name of the Lord, him and his sons for all time. So why must you give this faithfully? Because God has chosen certain men to stand and minister his word and his covenant to his people. And if you do not faithfully support the ministry of the gospel then it will not go forth and it will not be supported and the people will languish. And you might be asking yourself the question, well, did they always faithfully support the ministry of the priest? Uh, Was there ever a time when the priest and their families didn't receive their portion and their families began to starve? As a matter of fact, there was a time when that happened. Turn to the book of Nehemiah, chapter 13. Nehemiah Chapter 13, if you know your Old Testament history, Nehemiah, the walls are being rebuilt around Jerusalem, and why have the walls been torn down in the first place? Because the people of Israel and Judah had disobeyed the Lord, had worshipped idols, and God had sent in the army of Sennacherib in 722 B.C. to destroy the northern kingdom of Israel, and then God had sent in the army of Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon to destroy the southern kingdom of Judah and the city of Jerusalem in the year 586 B.C. Here we are, a generation after the destruction of Jerusalem, at the end of Old Testament history, and the people have gotten far from God. They have gone after other gods, they've worshipped other gods, they've suffered the loss of their nation and their cities and their homes and their lands. God is bringing them back in. Ezra, the priest, has led a revival and the people are to get back to worshipping the Lord and serving Him and rediscover the biblical foundation of what God has taught. But that later generation, trying to rediscover the truths of God's Word, thought they could... um, skimp on supporting the ministry of the priests. They didn't bring in their tithes, and the priest's families began to starve, and the priest said, I'm not going to let my wife and children starve. I'm going to go out and find something for them to eat. We read about this in Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 10. Nehemiah writes, I also found out that the portions of the Levites had not been given to them. Those portions that were commanded in Numbers 18 and Deuteronomy 18, as we just read. The tithes were not brought. So the priest's families were starving. So that the Levites and the singers who did the work, what work? The work of the ministry. They each fled to his field. Well, if the priests were out in the fields working... Who was in the temple ministering the covenant that God made with his people? No one. If if they don't support the ministry of the covenant, then the work of the ministry will not be done. And these men cannot be expected to allow their wife and children to starve to death. Verse 11, Nehemiah writes, So I confronted the officials. Notice that word, confronted. This is a serious sin before God. In not giving what was required to support the ministry, Nehemiah had to go and confront the officials who allowed this to happen. And I said, why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together and I set them in their stations. Nehemiah set them down and told them, how it was. This is what the word of God says, and you have neglected his clear command. Therefore, the house of God has been forsaken. No wonder the people are so far from God. 
There's no one there to minister on behalf of God's people to proclaim his word, to offer sacrifice for sin as the old covenant commanded. No wonder the nation was in such a spiritual malaise. Verse 12, Then all Judah brought the tithe of grain, wine, and oil into the storehouses. And as you go on and you read the rest of Nehemiah 13, the ministry of the priests was restored as the people began bringing the tithe into the storehouse and giving to the ministry at the temple. There was revival in the land. The people were restored. The walls were rebuilt. And God brought blessing to his people. You see, the principle that's being taught here, brothers and sisters, is that your spiritual needs are in fact greater than your physical needs. You might not realize that, but it's true. Your greatest need is not health, wealth, and prosperity. Your greatest need is to know Jesus Christ. You miss a meal, you'll go hungry. You miss Jesus, you'll perish for all eternity. The ministry of the gospel and the work of the local church is of vital importance. And we have to ask ourselves the question this morning, why did God make the Levitical priest dependent upon the faithful giving of his people so that if the people didn't faithfully give the tithe, then the priest would not be able to exist? Because God wanted that relationship. It made the people feel their responsibility to support the work of the ministry. And it made the priests realize their vulnerability before the people of God. They need, the people needed the priests to minister God's word and God's covenant on their behalf. And the priests needed the people to be faithful. Otherwise, they and their families would starve. God wants it that way because he wants to teach us the spiritual principle that our spiritual needs are greater than our physical needs. Anytime we spend money, we're making a moral decision. If I buy something for, say, $100, I'm saying that that is worth more to me than this $100 bill. Right? I would rather have this than the $100 bill. That's why I spend it on that item. When we give to the work of the ministry, what we're saying is it's more important to me that the work of the ministry of my local church go on than for me to keep this money. And when we hold on to that money and fail to give it, what we are saying is it's more important to me that I hold on to this then let the work of the ministry in my local church go on. You see, it's a moral decision. Now, obviously, we can't give it all away. That's why the Bible gives us some parameters and guidelines. And I'm not here today to tell you that you're under a law of tithing. That was true under the Old Covenant. The standard under the New Covenant is to give sacrificially. But I would just say to you that we need to at least... Try to have as a baseline what God gave his people under the old covenant as a standard. Why am I preaching on this? I know it's uncomfortable. I, I know we don't like to hear this. But brothers and sisters, I wanted you to get a biblical picture of how it worked under the old covenant so that you will understand that when you give, you're worshiping. You're saying, God, this money is going to be used for your work and your kingdom and the ministry of your gospel. I want to give it because I want the gospel to go forward. Thankfully, this church is full of many faithful givers. There's not a financial need, okay? That's not why I'm preaching this. I'm preaching this because it came up in the book of Joshua. But, nonetheless, we need to understand that when we come to worship... We sing, we pray, the word is preached, and we give. And those are all aspects of worship. So you need to understand that when you faithfully give, 
You are giving glory and praise to your Creator and your God. And you're saying, Lord, I would rather give this to the work of your church and the ministry of your gospel than to hold on to it for myself. And if I didn't give it, maybe I could drive a nicer car or eat out more often. But I would rather the gospel go forth. That is the moral decision that we make. I end this morning with Psalm chapter 16. Psalm 16, we see the command of the Levites. And this is their response to the fact that they received no land, but only the Lord is their portion. Psalm 16, verses 5 and 6. Remember the lot would fall and the land was allotted to the people? Well, what lot did the Levites get? They got the Lord, but they didn't get any land. Now notice this, verse 6. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. What are the lines? The boundary lines of what land you get. Well, what were the boundary lines for the Levites? There were none because they got no land. But the response is... The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. They they don't complain about it. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. What is that inheritance? Their inheritance is the Lord. He is their portion. In other words, my spiritual needs are greater than my physical needs. And if I have the Lord, I have enough. That is the principle behind giving. That is the principle of why God set it up this way and didn't give the Levites any of the land in Israel. Because our spiritual needs are indeed greater than our physical needs. And we need to put our spiritual needs first in every aspect of our lives. How we spend our time, how we spend our money, the things that we do and pursue. And I pray this morning that your heart would be set on making the Lord your portion and putting him first. Let's pray. Father, I thank you this morning for your word. And Lord, though this may be an unusual sermon from a difficult text on a difficult topic, God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would help us to see That giving is also worship. And that this giving would would overflow from gratitude of our hearts for what Christ has done for us. Jesus lived a perfect sinless life and died upon the cross to pay for our sins. And Lord, we are grateful and thankful. And we want his gospel to go forward and be proclaimed in this community and to the ends of the earth. So Lord, help us to remember that is why we worship. That is why we serve. That is why we give. Lord, I pray today that our hearts would be satisfied in Him. Help us to see that our spiritual needs are greater than our physical needs. That more than anything else, we need Jesus. In His name we pray. Amen.